Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Alex Brill, and I'm a resident fellow here at AEI. Our event today is titled Assessing the Impact of Tax Reform, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Senator Orrin Hatch. Senator Hatch is well known to this audience as the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, the senior senator from Utah, and president pro tem of the United States Senate. You may also know him from his appearances on the television show Parks and Rec, his well-regarded sense of humor, his effective Twitter feed, and of course, his musical talents. Senator Hatch is also, of course, an accomplished legislator. His most recent accomplishment is the subject of today's conference. Now, I must confess that on at least one occasion, I have praised the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee for their leadership over the last two years on the efforts of tax reform. And I may have said on occasion over that period of time that the Senate should be more publicly engaged in the debate and efforts to reform our tax code. Well, I suggest you read the final ta tax text of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act bill. It has the Senate Finance Committee's handprints all over it. What the House started, the Senate Finance Committee finished. That deal is now law, and the changes that have occurred, particularly with respect to business income, are profound. To share his views on the subject, please join me in welcoming Senator Orrin Hatch. Well, this is a privilege for me to be here. This is such a great organization, and it's one that I've paid a lot of attention to over the years and have fought alongside uh, in a great many battles that are very important to this country. So I'm grateful to be with you this morning. I want to thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hopefully, uh, I won't say uh, anything to make you regret it. But then again... <laughs> I am grateful for the opportunity to be here today and to participate in this event. The folks here at AEI do some great work. We depend on them quite a bit up there on Capitol Hill to provide information, background, and, of course, context on a number of key issues. I have relied on AEI for many years in a wide variety of issues. They also work to educate the public on the right policies that will help our economy and our people to prosper. Today we're here to talk about some important issues, particularly the impact of the new tax law and what all of it means for our country going forward. It took quite a bit of work to finally get our tax reform legislation over the finish line, as you probably noticed. And as we've seen in recent weeks, the country is already starting to benefit from it. It's a good thing the economy is doing so well, particularly for me, as you have heard, I'm going to be out of work here at the end of this year. I don't want to make this event awkward for anyone, but uh, if any of you know anyone who might be hiring, please put in a good word for me. <laughs> I've got a fair amount of experience, but even if it's not technically enough for a particular job, I'm a really quick learner. I'll make sure you all get a copy of my resume. No, that was joking. <laughs> I think I'm going to do fine. But seriously, I think it's fair to say that the new tax law is paying off much earlier than most of, us thought, most of us thought it would, which is a good thing. I'd like to talk for a moment about some of the specific things we were able to do on tax reform because much of it bears repeating. From the outset of last year's efforts between both chambers of Congress and the administration, one of our chief goals was to provide significant tax relief for the middle class. And by enacting reforms to both the individual and business tax systems, I, I think almost anybody would conclude we were successful in that effort. On the individual side, we were able to lower rates across the board with taxpayers in the middle class getting the largest proportional benefit of the tax cuts. Opponents of tax reform conveniently overlooked the fact, that fact by focusing only on the total benefits enjoyed by specific tax cohorts. But if you look at the system-wide distributional effects of the new, new law, you'll see some pretty 
significant benefits for middle-income families. The analysis by the Joint Committee on Taxation concluded that as a percentage of taxpayer income, the largest tax cuts go to those in the middle and lower income brackets. Post-reform, those at the higher end of the income spectrum will actually see their overall share of the tax burden go up slightly. In addition to lowering rates, we significantly increased the standard deduction and expanded the child tax credit, which provided additional targeted relief to the middle class. Also, for tens of millions of American families, filling out tax returns will be a much simpler manner, thanks to the new tax law. With a dramatic increase in the standard deduction, we ensured that the vast majority of U.S. taxpayers, more than 9 out of 10, will be able to file a simple return without going through the previous maze of deductions and credits. Now, that's something that has also been overlooked. But as people continue to evaluate the impact of tax reform, I think they'll see some significant savings in both time and money on the part of middle class taxpayers because of this simplification. Now let's move to the business side. America has always had an innate entrepreneurial spirit encoded in its DNA. And for most of our nation's history, our government has tried to foster that spirit, encouraging our people to think and dream big, and then put in the work to make those big thoughts and dreams a reality. But in recent decades, our government seemed to have a different focus. For too long, American job creators, both large and small, were forced to operate under the weight of a burdensome and arcane tax code. In working on tax reform, fixing that problem was another one of our chief goals, and on that count, I believe we were successful. Foremost among the many business tax reforms we enacted is the reduction of the corporate tax rate from 35%, which was the highest in the industrialized world, down to 21%, which puts us roughly on a par with most of our international trading partners. Prior to the passage of our tax bill, members from both parties worked for years to accomplish this important goal. In fact, Presidents Obama and Clinton, Senate Minority Leader Schumer, Finance Committee Ranking Member Wyden, as well as former Finance Chairman Baucus, all supported lowering the corporate tax rate. I just mentioned these names, and there are many others, to illustrate that the idea to reduce our corporate tax rate wasn't just something Republicans dreamed up. It was the major focus of tax reform for people on both sides. In fact, prior to last year, there were very few people outside a Bernie Sanders rally who would honestly argue that our corporate tax rate should not come down. Very, very few, and for good reason. Yet the truth is that lowering the corporate rate was always about helping the middle class. That was true when it was a bipartisan goal, and it was true at the end of last year when Republicans were finally able to make good on years of promises to make that idea a reality. Allow me to demonstrate why that is the case. According to JCT, workers bear 25% of the corporate tax burden. Some place that number much higher. Moreover, in just the last 20 years or so, we've seen a massive expansion of pension and retirement assets, most of which are invested in corporate stocks. Perhaps surprisingly, nearly four out of every $10 invested in stock ownership is currently held in retirement uh, plan accounts. That is the largest owner category of overall stock ownership in the United States. And while corporate profits have climbed steadily over the last two decades, the retirement plans of middle-class America have expanded as well. In fact, the success of our nation's retirement system has been the largest accumulator of middle-class wealth in history. We're talking about trillions of dollars 
in pension assets owned by, uh, uh, owned by uh, households and nonprofit organizations. And the total amount has gone up by almost 200% in the last 20 years. That is a direct connection between the success of American corporations and the growth of Americans' retirement assets. So when you hear some of my colleagues argue that the gains for middle-class workers are mere, quote, crumbs, unquote, and the real money is going to stock buybacks, remember that as companies increase the value of their stock holdings, the largest group of beneficiaries and those people with pensions are those people with pensions, IRAs, and 401ks. And the benefits of the lower corporate rate don't end there. Almost every day, we hear news stories about how companies are responding to the lower rates. Thanks to the new tax law, companies can uh, manufacture, store, transfer, build, research, innovate, create, paint, draw, uh, exercise, plant, till, mow, lathe, carve, and keep the lights on for less than they paid before. This increased activity means more jobs for workers and increased benefits for current employees. This is not theoretical. It's happening before our very eyes as more and more companies announce wage hikes, bonuses, and uh, expanded benefits for workers and increased investment in the American economy. We've seen utility companies announce that they were lowering rates on energy bills for customers across the board. We've seen companies like Cigna Corporation, which has raised its base wage to $16 an hour and improved its employer 401k matches. U-Haul uh, recently announced that all of its full-time employees would be getting $1,200 in bonuses with part-time employees netting $500. All told, more than 28,000 U-Haul employees will be receiving bonuses, providing them with around $23 million in benefits. Tyson Foods announced a few weeks back that 100,000 full and part-time employees would be getting bonuses of $1,000 and $500. Aflac is making a one-time contribution of $500 to every employee's 401k. Plus, they are doubling their current match from 50% to 100% on the first 4% of compensation. And one of my personal favorites uh, for creativity, Hostess Brands, will be giving their employees free snacks for a year plus $750 in cash bonuses and another $500 in 401k contributions, by the way. Where are those snacks for us poor members of Congress? You know, I think they should get with it. All told, the number of companies... Uh, I'm only kidding, of course. Uh, that would get me in real trouble. All told, the number of companies that have made these types of announcements, numbers in the hundreds, the number of workers who are receiving these benefits is in the millions. For a middle-class family, $1,000 is three or four car payments, a couple, a couple months' worth of groceries, or rent or a mortgage payment. And as the economy continues to expand, American workers will continue to benefit as will the companies that employ them. During the tax reform debate, one of my uh, colleagues on the other side came to the floor several times and repeated the same slogan, quote, the proof is in the paycheck, unquote. She was right. But for millions of workers, the proof is already there. For millions more, that proof will show up this week as the new withholding amounts start to take effect and the vast majority of Americans see an increase in their take-home pay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really interesting stuff to me. That may not be to you, but uh, if it isn't, you'd better get with another organization. <laughs> of course, the success of the corporate tax reform goes beyond benefits for new employees. 
We're also seeing Americans, American multinational companies op opting to return foreign earnings for reinvestment in the United States. Let me just give you a short list of companies that are reinvesting in the American economy. The Kraft Heinz Company, $800 million. AT&T, $1 billion. FedEx, $1.5 billion. Apple, $30 billion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're not even through the first quarter of 2018, yet we're already seeing tens of billions of announced reinvestment in the American economy, which will mean more work for suppliers, builders, contractors, researchers, technicians, manufacturers, and many others who want to do business here in the United States. And the funny thing is, while some of us may be a little surprised at this happening so quickly, these benefits of tax reform were what we predicted when we drafted the bill. And our predictions were pretty much ignored by the other side. But when we drafted the bill and moved it through Congress, we predicted this. With that last uh, of, of less companies, the ones bringing earnings back to the U.S., there is more going on than just a lower corporate tax rate. The reforms to our international system have had something to do with that as well. With the new tax law, we finally did away with the overly complex and draconian worldwide tax system and replaced it with a much more competitive territorial system. Why we didn't do that years ago is beyond me. We're just stupid. And we did so in ways that are in accord with our international commitments and obligations. Simply stated, under the new law, companies and investors will pay taxes, for the most part, only on earnings accrued here in the United States. Gone are the days where complex transfer pricing, foreign tax credits, and competing patent box regimes led companies to move their investments and activities offshore in search of more favorable tax conditions. Much of the pressure for companies to invert or be taken over or to otherwise move investments offshore has been relieved. And many of the disincentives for companies to invest and grow businesses here in the United States have been eliminated. As a result, America is now a place where more companies will want to set up their headquarters, create jobs, and add to our economy. These moves to bring our tax code into the 21st century and bring us more in line with our international competitors aren't the only businesses uh, reforms included in the new tax law. We also enacted some very... Uh, we, we also enacted some very uh, interesting and beneficial significant reforms for smaller businesses. For example, thanks to the work of many of our members, we were able to craft a pass-through deduction regime that provides virtual equivalence to the corporate rate. Now, companies can choose whether they want to have a partnership, corporation, LLC, or sole proprietorship based on the merits and structural benefits of those organizational types instead of thinking purely about reducing their tax liability. We also finally did away with the individual mandate uh, tax that was established under that wonderful bill called Obamacare. Now, if you didn't catch on, I was being very sarcastic. That was the stupidest, dumbass bill <laughs> that I've ever seen. Now, some of you may have loved it. If you do, you are one of the stupidest, dumbass people I've ever met. This was, this was one, of, and there are a lot of them up there on Capitol Hill from time to time. This was one of the most regressive taxes in the tax code, with lower income families paying most of the freight. The individual mandate represented one of the great ironies of Obamacare. The law forced people to buy health insurance or pay a tax while also making health insurance less affordable. By zeroing out the individual mandate tax, 
The new tax law took a major step forward uh, in the ongoing uh, effort to fully repeal and replace Obamacare. All told, the new tax reform law on both the individual and business sides has already started providing for greater benefits and security for Americans across the board. It is giving relief to low-income families. It is simplifying the lives of millions of people in the middle class and increasing the size of their paychecks. It is resulting in wage growth and expanded benefits for workers in a number of different industries. And it is making the United States a better destination for investment and job creation. These are all good things. And they are exactly what we intended when we crafted our legislation and worked to get it to the president's desk. I've been around a long time here. And I want to thank those here today who played a role and helped us get uh, to this position that we're in. And of course, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning to listen. We live in the greatest country in the world, bar none. I've been all over the world a number of times, by the way. And frankly, there's no other country that even comes close to ours. Well, there might be one or two that you can say do pretty well, but they're, they're really not in the league with us. As dumb as we are, and as stupid as some of our policies have been over the years. But I can tell you that uh, no other country can really compete with the United States if we allow our true entrepreneurial spirit to go forward. And I intend to say that we do that. And frankly, there's been a change up there on Capitol Hill, and even my Democrat friends are starting to wake up on some of these things. The problem is, is that their major supporter happens to be the union movement in this country. Now, a lot of them don't even know anything about unions. They were raised in relative plenty. Warren Hatch knows a lot about unions. I was raised in the union movement. I earned a union card. I was a woodwire and metal lather. They are now carpenters. They merged with the carpenters. But it was a tough trade, a very skilled trade. And, uh, and I'm glad I had that experience. I was born in a family that was not rich. We were poor. My dad was a, was a metal lather. Fortunately, he was one of the best in the city of Pittsburgh. And he taught me his trade. And to this day, I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful for the fact that I knew that trade and I was really good at it. In fact, I had to make a decision whether to continue into, uh, in that trade where I was making journeyman's money, which was pretty darn good, or go to Brigham Young University. Well, my mother wanted me to go on to college. She, thought, she saw something in me that maybe others didn't. And... I was thinking very seriously about going into my trade full time. But I received a $25 scholarship from Brigham Young University. We were so poor, and I was so impressed with that, I decided to go to Brigham Young University. And I'm glad I did. Ultimately, I went to the University of Pittsburgh School of Law on a full honor scholarship, which in itself is quite an interesting story and became a partner in Pittsburgh's oldest law firm in four years. And then decided I wanted to raise my kids in Utah, so we moved out there and I formed my own law firm out there. And we were going great guns. My junior partner, who had nothing when he came with me other than a master's in tax from NYU, which is a lot more than nothing, but he didn't have, he wasn't making any money. He's now worth probably 50 to 100 million dollars. I'm not. I mean, I, I left there right at the time when we were taking off to run for the U.S. Senate, and I'm happy that I did. It was, the, as far as I'm concerned, the right thing for me to do. And I have the kind of a wife who put up with that. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I have to say that I've enjoyed being in the United States Senate. Now, I'm, I've announced my retirement at the end of this year. Mitt Romney, I think, is going to try and take my place, which is something that I pushed for. I went and talked to him personally to see if he would do this. 
because I don't want somebody who cannot do important things there to just go back there and sit. And Mitt has that kind of ability where he can bring some very good financial know, know all to the United States Senate, and I think uh, would be a great senator, at least for a while. I want you to know that throughout my now 42 years in the United States Senate, the longest of any Republican who's ever served, I'm not bragging about it, I'm just stating it because it's important. AEI has been a very, very important organization to me. I read your papers. I pay attention to many, many of the publications and, and many of the oral presentations. I think this is a great organization, and I feel honored that you've invited me here today. I hope this hadn't been too boring for you, but this is, uh, this is the way it is. If I'm not boring, then I'm not doing my job well. Because <laughs> we tax people, we tend to be really boring, is all I can say. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to AEI. I'm grateful that you're all studying and learning and growing. I'm grateful for those of you who help us up there on Capitol Hill. We need the help. No matter how good you are, it is so complex today, especially the tax code, that we need help from good people like you. So be encouraged. Just know that this old boy thinks the world of you, and I'm grateful to be here today. Thanks so much. Great to see you. He, he's asked me to take a couple of questions, and I've got to get my tail back to Capitol Hill. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. Thank you for being here. Um, Thank you. I'm Amal Akan. I'm from the Epoch Times. Um, I would like to know the impact of tax cuts in the United States on other company, uh, countries. Um, I, I know some countries express worries about um, how U.S. is becoming more competitive and Germany's express their worries. Um, do you think um, this will create um, a new round of tax competition among countries? And are you worried um, in the long term or in short term this will create um, an impact on um, U.S. economic growth if a tax competition starts? Well, I'm always concerned about all these matters, but I don't think that cutting taxes uh, makes us uncompetitive. In fact, it, it, it basically has caused us to soar. And other countries in this, uh, in this world have found that to be the case, too. And we're in a very competitive world right now. The United States uh, has to compete. And one of the best ways we can is to make sure that we provide uh, not just an entrepreneurial spirit, but we provide opportunities and incentives for people in the business community to be able to move ahead and, and do better. It also involves a lot of really effective foreign policy. Uh, and I have to say, we haven't always done that. So it's amazing to me how some other countries have become much more free enterprise oriented than us and uh, over individual uh, countries' uh, lives and uh, and we're, we're, we have to catch up with some of them. But the United States is the greatest country in the world. I've traveled all over the world, and every time I've gotten back, I want to get on my knees and kiss the ground when I compare us to any other country in the world. And I'm not bragging about it, I'm just saying that this is a great country. We have a great system. Our Constitution works. And it works because we have a great people here. And we have a complex society made up of people from all over the world who wanted to come here because of opportunity, for the most part. And uh, we shouldn't knock it. We should, we should do everything in our power to keep our country moving ahead. And that means getting government, getting government into its proper role, not into an over, overly dominant role on everything. And I think we're making some headway. Some people have been very critical of Donald Trump. I was the only senator in the United States Senate who supported Donald Trump through the election process. The only one. People thought it was crazy. And uh, all I can say is that 
I just knew he was the only one who might pull us out of the mess we're in. And he still has a lot of, a lot of uh, work to do to be able to do that. But he's just uh, entrepreneurial enough and crazy enough to do it uh, in my eyes. And, and he has the guts to go out and do it regardless of what the media is saying about him and what other people are saying about him. Plus, he's a lot of fun to be around. So, you know, I think we're going to see some pretty interesting years with, with him as our president. And uh, I think he's done a pretty good job when you consider he's had zero Democrat support for most of this year. And some lacking Republican support, too, which has made it very, very difficult. Anybody would have been crushed out of the way he was treated over this last year. Well, I could go on and on, but I'll let it go at that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, I mean. Okay. Then I'll come back in that last row again, okay? Hi, my name is Nancy Kuhn. I'm a tax attorney. I used to work at the IRS as a tax attorney. Yeah. I've been dismayed the last few years watching the IRS's budget be cut, cut, cut. Well, all these people hate you because of your former employment. But how, how, is there any hope that the IRS will have budget increases so that they can have a hope of being able to adequately interpret and enforce this new massive tax law? You raise a very important point because we have not been very good to the IRS. And the IRS does a pretty darn good job under the circumstances. Yeah, there are things you can criticize and things you wish you could make better. But, uh, yeah, I th that's something I'm certainly looking at. And uh, I want to help them down there. I think they do a very, very good job. Much better than people give them credit for. Uh, so keep up the good work. <laughs> I'll take you and then we'll ha I, don't ha I don't have to do it. Yes, ma'am. Pat Lucero with uh, MLEX U.S. Tax Watch. Uh, to follow up on the IRS question, what's the status on uh, the, nom um, the confirmation hearing for the IRS nominee, Charles Reddick? For what now? For the IRS commissioner nominee, Charles Reddick. What's the Senate finance status on that? I'm not quite sure right now. Uh, I, I, I do believe that we ought to put these people through and get them to, get them to work. But I, I have to say that this whole year has been a, almost a tragedy because Democrats have made, us, have made us have open votes on people that win 96 to nothing. It's ridiculous. And you have to go through this whole process of overcoming a filibuster and, and all these other delays. It's really ridiculous. There's no cooperation at all. And we're starting to break through that. And the perfect illustration is on judges. Now, normally in the past, we just put the judges through. Because by the time they go through this arduous process, we know they're pretty darn good. And we've examined them in every possible way. But it's now become standard for us to have to take three days or more with every nominee because the Democrats have required it and filibuster every judge, even though they pass 96 to zero in the end. They hate Donald Trump so badly that that's what they're doing to him. And I think I'd like to get them over these juvenile approaches and, and, uh, and work together. Now, you might say, well, that's nice for you, Senator. Well, it is nice for me because I have a reputation for working across party lines and bringing people together. The heralded reputation came with uh, Senator Kennedy, who never passed a bill before I became chairman of the Labor Committee. He was effective because he was a leading uh, liberal spokesperson. But he didn't have much success in passing bills because even the Democrats, especially the Southern Democrats, hated his guts. Well, I didn't hate his guts. I, th I saw a, a really fine senator with an awful lot of ability. I didn't agree with him on very much, but I, he was a hard worker. He, he was willing to get involved. And we gradually formed a, when I became chairman of the Labor Committee in 40 years the first time, uh, uh, he walked over and said, I'm going to work with you. I said, well, I hope so, because I'm going to need you to help. And he did. 
And when he, they became the majority, I worked with him and helped him. And in the process, we were known as the odd couple because he was very liberal, I was very conservative, and, and uh, I think we did some of the best work in the Senate at the time. And I give him a lot of credit for having been willing to do that. And it was quite a unique experience for him. A lot of people didn't realize that Kennedy was the leading Democrat liberal spokesperson, but as far as getting bills through, even most of the Democrats wouldn't vote for him because they were all Southern Democrats, or a lot of them were. And they didn't care for Kennedy because uh, uh, they were basically conservative Southern Democrats. And when I started to work together with him, they, they liked me, but they were willing to say, all right, if Hatch says it's all right, it, 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 we've got a chance. And then the liberal people who didn't want to work with me start saying, well, if Kennedy th says it's all right, then we have a chance. And we passed an awful lot of legislation that is today doing a good job for this country. And I mourn the death of Ted Kennedy. He was a pain in the neck a lot of the time, but he was a good senator. And I was one of those who really cared for him. And uh, I cared for him much more than his Democrat colleagues did. Uh, but I also, we would, we would get into these awful fights on the floor where we'd be going at each other and, uh, like, like banshees. And, and uh, I remember all those, all those times. And uh, it was a great learning experience for me. And I think it was for him, too, because he hadn't passed many bills. In fact, I don't know of any bills he'd passed before I became chairman of the Labor Committee. So, but it set an example for almost everybody that uh, liberals and conservatives can get together and they can do good work together if they, if they just try. Let me close by saying that it's a privilege for me to be here with you. I hope I haven't bored you all to death, but uh, this is a great organization. I have tremendous respect for it. I read the policy papers that come from AEI and uh, I, th I, I think more on Capitol Hill should read them, and they're generally very, very good. So God bless all of you, and thanks for inviting me. Great to be with you. Good morning. I'm Alan Viard of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, having heard Senator Hatch's remarks, we now have the privilege of hearing further discussion of the tax law from a very distinguished panel. Time is uh, short. I do want to try to leave some time at the end for audience questions. So I think we'll just uh, dive right in. Uh, we'll first heal, hear from Kyle Pomerlo of the Tax Foundation. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alex, for inviting me. Um, I think it was a great um, accomplishment that lawmakers were able to pass um, this tax package um, overall. Um, and uh, here I'm going to, in my 10 minutes of time, strict 10 minutes, I'm going to have a few comments about some of the policies, um, give a few thoughts on how I think about the economic growth over the next 10 years and in the long run, and also some comments about what now, so what lawmakers should focus on going forward. So general policy-wise, I mean, there were good accomplishments here, but by no mean would I say that this is an ideal tax reform package. Um, the good stuff here are the things that made improvements. I think the lower corporate tax rate is an improvement. Um, it's going to reduce the incentive for profit shifting. It reduces the cost of capital and encourages additional investment. Um, the new territorial tax system will for the most part, remove the incentive for companies to shift their residents from the United States over to other countries. The faster cost recovery, the 100% bonus expensing, um, another aspect that will increase investment, um, especially or only during the years in which it is uh, it, it applies. 
I also think some of the base broadening on the corporate side was good, especially um, limitations on the interest expense deduction. Um, and then on the individual side, and I think Alex is going to get into this much more, um, I think there was some good simplification, especially with the standard deduction uh, that pushed a lot of people into a much simpler um, world of tax filing. And I think there's also some downsides to the tax law. I think the big one that I want to point out more than anything is the temporary nature of a large portion of the tax law. Uh, the individual portions of the tax uh, law are supposed to expire uh, near the end of the budget window. 100% bonus is going to expire in, in four years. Um, uh, and I think that this was a consequence of choosing to make the tax law a tax <laughs> cut rather than revenue neutral. Um, and I think lawmakers, they're betting on the ability to be able to extend a lot of these things. They're hoping it's going to be popular. But I think from a taxpayer perspective, that's a, that's a risk. And I think... Um, it creates uncertainty for taxpayers and sort of violates one of these principles of good tax policy, which is stability. I also think there are some policy issues um, in the in the tax law as well. Um, one of the big ones that I want to point out is I don't think that there's a significant justification for the deduction for pass-through businesses. Um, it's pretty complicated, and I think if you were to say that it is something that we do need, I think it could have been structured a, a little better. I mean, then there are some smaller things about how um, the BEAT, uh, some international provisions were structured, such as the BEAT, and also um, the interest deduction limitation, especially in the out years. I think there are some incentive issues that that creates. So how do I think about the, the economic impact of, of the tax law? Well, I think it's driven a lot by the lower cost of capital, um, especially in the first five years with expensing. This lower cost of capital will drive additional investment. Um, and in the long run, I still think that you'll have a lower cost of capital as well, especially due the corporate tax rate is permanently lower um, here. But I think there are reasons why we should be you know, more realistic about how much growth to expect, not to think about this as a permanent 3% increase in GDP growth, more like, especially in the first years of bigger boost, but then in the long run, a more reasonable one. Um, one is the temporary nature of expensing. Um, two, the expensing provision leaves out buildings. Uh, buildings is a large portion of the capital stock in the United States, and instead of going for expensing for all assets, they just went with 50% bonus and extended that law to 100%, still leaving out a large um, section of our, of our capital stock. Then on the individual side, statutory rates were reduced. You would think that that's going to increase uh, labor force uh, participation, encourage people to work a little bit more. But there's an offsetting effect, especially those in upper middle to upper income, and that's the elimination of the state and local tax deduction. And to be clear, I, I think eliminating fully the state and local tax deduction would be good policy, but it also comes with a trade-off that it does slightly boost marginal tax rates for those that are paying their state and local income taxes, and that is a slight offsetting factor as well. So from the individual side, I don't think you should expect a, a, big, a big change there, um, especially up at the high end. And... Uh, one reminder, and this goes to the debate about bonuses and buybacks and all that, uh, a lot of these effects are long-run effects, and long-run effects on the size of the economy and not the growth rate. Um, don't expect investment and wages and all that stuff to increase right after the tax law was passed. This stuff is going to take time. Um, so directly pointing at you know, a certain bonus check that says TCGA on it is probably not you know the smartest idea um, and this is a multi-year thing where we need to wait and to see how investment will play out in the long run. Uh, just to wrap this up, what now um, for lawmakers? I think lawmakers should focus on making as much um, of the good stuff in the tax law as permanent as possible. Um, a stable tax code is a better tax code than in uh, one that is un unstable. Uh, and then related to that, I think on the individual side, when thinking about what to make permanent and what to allow to expire, I think there should be a focus on um, things that broaden the tax base. 
um, and make it simpler rather than focusing significantly on lower statutory um, individual income tax rates. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Next, we'll hear from Maya McGinnis from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Good, thank you. Thanks, everybody, and Alan and Alex. Thank you very much for having us to AEI. And I, like Senator Hatch, I'm a big fan of the scholarship that comes out of here. Um, also, every time I come to events here, I realize how much I love this conference room. But it wasn't until today I realized how much I love those super futuristic podiums. So this is just great. AEI is a great organization for many reasons. Um, I'm going to touch Best. upon just kind of the pros and cons of the tax reform as I see it and then dig a little bit deeper into two of the bigger cons, which would be the fiscal effects um, and kind of the unintended political economy consequences that I, I think have come out of it. Um, but to start with the good things, because there were a lot, um, though I would overall describe the tax reform slash cut legislation as a big missed opportunity. But there are a lot of reasons we definitely needed tax reform. I think that was widely, widely believed. And a lot of those things were accomplished in terms of lowering the corporate tax rate quite significantly, which I think will help with competitiveness and avoid a trend that I really was worried about, which was an ongoing growth in corporate inversions where corporations were leaving, um, and the changes to expensing. So I think that there were changes on the corporate side that improve the, the tax code in ways that had been being discussed and, as the senator said, did have bipartisan support and were important to pursue. Um, a lot of my goods are both in my good and bad category. But one of my goods also is that there was some real progress on base broadening. So interest deductibility was one of them on, on the corporate side. I also think it was um, real progress that we did something on a state and local deduction and the home mortgage interest deduction. Home mortgage interest deduction, uh, many people probably are big fans of it. I have been a big fan of, of eliminating or reforming it. And I experienced once that the only death threat I ever got is when I wrote an op-ed arguing that we should perform the home mortgage interest deduction. Um, and I unwisely placed it in the LA Times, not the place to run that op-ed. But so I know it's controversial. But a lot of these tax breaks that are in the tax code, and there are, were over one and a half trillion of them per year, um, are actually part of the problem of tax policy. They are so inefficient, and they, they pay people to do things they would do anyhow. They misallocate resources. So I think making progress on some of the reforms on ones that had been seen as third rails was um, important, not just because of the policy, but showing that we can touch them. That said, there's a lot of pushback, and I'm really worried, at least on the state and local, that we'll see some scaling back of the reforms instead of using that to start a further discussion. Also, as was mentioned, I think moving more people onto the standard deduction is very useful because it moves you away from the whole world of tax expenditures and using all of these different tax breaks, and uh, which I would rather have a, a diminished dependency on. So some of the weaknesses. Um, this, one I, this, this isn't my bad column, but it might actually be good. So the corporate rate reduction was so much more aggressive than most people thought it was going to be. I didn't think it needed to go as low as it was going to. I think that you could have achieved a lot of the goals with less of a cut in the corporate tax rate, and that would have been less costly. On the other hand, I put myself in the category of somebody who would eliminate the corporate tax if we were able to find a way to do it. So decreasing our dependency on the tax overall is a good thing. But we spent a lot of money on lowering rates that if we had paid for them, I would have been a big fan of. Given that they were deficit financed, I think we did more on rate reduction than we had to. Certainly, I think the temporary na nature of the tax cuts is really problematic. This just exacerbates the problem that we have of jumping from fiscal cliff to fiscal cliff. There was a huge irony throughout all this, which was lawmakers argued they wanted to have their tax code, code or their tax cuts considered against a current policy baseline, which assumes all expiring tax cuts are extended and don't have to be paid for, at the very same time that they were saying, oh, a lot of our tax cuts will expire, so we don't have to pay for them. And then kind of in a third uh, inconsistent point, they would say, but don't worry, wink, wink, we're going to extend them. So this just goes to budget baselines, tax baselines, how we do this is really problematic. It's incredibly not transparent. And so if there's something uh, more complicated and perhaps less interesting to most people than tax policy, it would be budget process. But there is a budget process task force that's going to go on this year. And I think looking at things like baselines and how we mess around with them, which can have in this case, it, it had a, a price tag of $500 billion as part of the tax cut. I think that could be really important. Um, as I mentioned, there was a huge loss in not doing much more base broadening. 
the key to making this tax reform right, in my mind, would have been lowering the rates as we did, but also broadening the base. And we just did not tackle tax expenditures nearly as much as we should have. There was very little discussion of how we could eliminate most of them. Um, Simpson Bowles had an interesting idea where you eliminate all of them, and then you decide on each tax break which one is worth putting back in the tax code, and you increase your rates to offset the cost of that. It's a really interesting mechanism to put a cost on those tax breaks, which are incredibly costly, but appear to be free the way we, we have them. And I wish we'd tackled them a lot more uh, and had a much simpler base. Um, I do think that we lost a huge opportunity by not paying for this tax bill, and I'll talk about the fiscal effects, but mainly because the growth effects, which are really quite modest by almost all accounts of this, would have been higher if they had not been deficit financed. Tax cuts grow the economy. Debt uh, decreases growth in the economy, and so it undermines a lot of the potential growth effects. I think one of the most important objectives that we can have right now as a country is to find uh, and put in place a comprehensive economic growth plan. Tax reform is a key part of that. It's a lost opportunity because we didn't do it in enough of a pro-growth way, and debt, not debt financing it would have been uh, very helpful. So then on to the fiscal effects. We ended up with a tax cut that will add $1 to $2 trillion to the national debt at a time when the debt relative to the economy is twice our historical average, twice where it was when we went into the downturn of 2008. One of the biggest wor reasons to worry about deficits is because when we hit a next downturn, you want to have both monetary policy and fiscal policy available to help. Our fiscal policy is hamstrung because we have such high debt levels. Debt as a share of the economy is the highest it's been since right after World War II. That makes no sense during a time of a growing economy. We should be bringing that significantly down. And we're on course. We were on course before this to borrow another $10 trillion, where debt would soon be reaching almost 100% of GDP. We're now on course to borrow, after this tax cut and a really irresponsible spending increase, uh, anywhere from 12 or 11 to $14 trillion. And one of the things I'm actually worried about is that we're going to start normalizing trillions. Borrowing a trillion dollars should not be okay. We need to be finding ways to save probably four, three, four, five trillion dollars over the next 10 years, ideally, if we wanted to get our debt to a reasonable level. And so this is just, we have a mammoth task in front of us, and by borrowing another trillion to two trillion dollars, depending if you make this tax cut permanent or not, we have dug the hole. Like, think if you're looking at a mountain you're trying to scale, and it's already really difficult to scale it, and... You're doing it as two teams who are so busy beating each other up, like our two political parties are, that doing anything hard is even harder. And then you decide to dig a huge hole and use that as your starting point. That's what we're doing every time we borrow more instead of dealing with these fiscal challenges. So I don't want to see borrowing so much for a tax cut and then a subsequent spending bill normalizing, don't worry, we can borrow for everything. But I think that's one of the big negative effects. So to move on to my two political economy effects, I think normalizing borrowing is a huge problem. I think we broke kind of the fiscal constraints that existed. Given how high our debt is, we should be really worried about it, but suddenly we're in this mentality of, don't worry, it will pay for itself. Everything will pay for itself, and kind of free lunch economics. Another thing I worried about in the whole tax debate was the loss of trust in numbers. And it's sort of two things. On one hand, on this panel, there are a lot of people who put out their own numbers, including our organization, that were really I won't say ours were, everybody's, like yours were, yours were, really useful in the debate. It was really great to kind of see the free flowing of new information enhancing and improving the information that's out there. And I'm also going to just give a shout out to Kyle. I also learned what really good tweeting is through some of the work of him and his colleagues. But there were really good discussions that you could have about deep tax policy that were very useful. But at the same time, what we also saw was politicians basically just making up numbers that were not in the realm of possibilities. That's really damaging when you're kind of arguing for growth effects that aren't likely to happen in any of the normal models. And I want to make sure that we continue to use good empirical analysis to help guide our policy making. And the final concern I have is that big tax cuts that weren't paid for undermine the arguments for what we really need to do to get our fiscal situation under control, which is reforms of our big mandatory programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And because we have such a politically polarized environment, and we had one, uh, no Democrats participated in the tax cut vote, so we had one partisan tax bill 
that has now given excuse to the other party to say, we're not showing up and helping on entitlement reform at all. And frankly, there are very few Republicans pushing for it at the moment, too. Um, we have set the set, taken many, many steps back in what we need to be doing to tackle the fiscal challenges. So I'm really worried about the overall political economy effects as well as the fiscal effects. And I would just end saying it was such an important opportunity to do tax reform right. And basically, because we weren't willing to do the hard work of offsetting the costs, which I would have said was from broadening the base, I think we lost a tremendous amount in that opportunity. Thanks, Maya. Now we'll hear again from Alex Brill. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thanks, everyone, uh, for, for being here. It was nice to see that not very many people left when Senator Hatch left. So a serious tax crowd here. Um, I want to... Um, th there are so many parts of this tax bill. Um, there's a tendency, I think... Um, to focus um, uh, a lot on the macro impacts, um, and those are important. Those are a driving force and motivation behind this reform. But there are so many, many other um, smaller impacts that we're going to, uh, to just really discover over the next few years that we can begin to identify as potential uh, policy changes. And I, I want to just touch on a couple of them in a, in a minute. Um, but we focus a lot on, the, on what the level of GDP might be a decade from now, um, and sometimes uh, fail to appreciate the fact that the composition of GDP um, may also be changing, both uh, industry to industry or, or, or other factors um, as well. Uh, we could see, uh, I think, likely uh, changes in how firms finance their investment. So there's a question about what the levels of investment are, are going to be. It's been widely discussed, but also I think we should expect changes in things like um, the use of debt versus the use of, of equity going forward. Um, as, as Maya noted, um, in addition to the economic changes of this bill and um, there are going to be a lot of there are a lot of political economy aspects that are important as well the, the question uh, to Senator Hatch earlier I think is a really valuable one what the what will be the response of other governments um, what will be the response of our own government in future congresses and what will be the response of state and local governments to the changes that were enacted and what will be the change the responses to, to foreign governments um, and so there's just uh, I feel sometimes almost overwhelmed with the, the myriad of changes and the sort of the questions that it poses when we, when we sort of start to drill down um, on, onto the more micro level of, of a bill of this magnitude. Um, I want to just take a, a couple minutes um, and try to get us a little bit back on, on track time-wise and, and talk about um, some changes on the individual side. Um, Kyle mentioned them. Senator uh, Hatch uh, actually talked about it more than I would have anticipated. Um, and that's changes um, due to and related to the change in the standard deduction. Um, you know, increasing the standard deduction was never really a traditional Republican objective in tax reform. It was always about bringing down uh, statutory rates. Um, but for a number of years, as this tax reform has, has a matured and evolved and ultimately became law, um, Republicans have been advocating for a large increase in the standard deduction. And so I just want to touch on, on three consequences um, or, of that, or three things that have been suggested. Um, one is the increase in the standard deduction um, as a matter of simplification and fairness. Um, using AEI's um, own modeling, something called the OSPC, the Open Source Policy Centers, which is a, a platform here at AEI for doing tax analysis, using the o OSPC model, um, we uh, looked at the, the, the pre and post impact of tax reform, and particularly the changes as it results, relates to the standard deduction. Absent tax reform, there would have been 45.2 million tax filers who itemized uh, in 2018. As a result of tax reform, um, 19.4 million will, um, will itemize, um, an increase in, in standard deduction takers of about 26 million. Um, this is a dramatic simplification. Of course, earlier versions of the tax reform bill would have gone further, putting even more people um, on the standard deduction, but, but um, fewer than half as many um, as previous. And so who cares? What's the, what's the impact? Well, Senator Hatch said, obviously, this makes the forms um, easier to fill out, you know, assuming we're not doing this on a computer or having someone do it for us. But it also promotes um, a, a fairness in an important degree, a, a type of fairness that I don't think we talk about enough, horizontal equity. Uh, two taxpayers um, in the same situation um, do they pay the same amount of tax? And so in my view, two taxpayers who are identical, except one rents and one owns, in my view, those two taxpayers should pay the same amount of tax. Um, as a result of this change, 
that will be more true. Not completely true, but, but closer to true. So there'll be more taxpayers who are in similar situations starting from the same starting point, both taking the standard deduction. Um, and that promotes an, an important um, uh, type of fairness in the system. Um, and I think it has actually political economy implications because I think it improves the trust in the system. If people sort of have a sense that their neighbor or their coworker uh, who's similarly situated is probably paying about the same amount of tax, I think they probably have a lot more trust in the system. I think in the old system, they thought that was probably unlikely, that they're, in fact, that their neighbor or their coworker was probably paying less, and in many cases, that was true. Um, I think that's an important part of the tax reform. Um, there are other consequences of the increase in the standard deduction and, that I want to just touch on briefly. Um, one is the impact on charitable giving. So uh, under the old system, where large numbers of people were itemizers, 35.7 um, million uh, filers claimed uh, some amount of charitable giving on their tax return and, and received a deduction for that, received a, a federal subsidy for that giving. Uh, under the new law, 16.4 million, only 16.4, 30, 30, almost 36 down to 16. So a decline of about 20 million um, uh, returns that claim um, charitable giving. Now, for these ta taxpayers who are affected this way, the price of giving rises to a dollar for, for every dollar that they give. Previously, it was one minus their tax rate, so it could have been as low as um, 65 cents cost to them to give a dollar away. Now, I think that this policy is as it was previously structured, in fact, as it's structured today, is sort of, uh, it's pretty strange. Uh, for one reason, we have a charitable giving subsidy that's primarily available for those individuals who are homeowners and live in high tax states. In other words, it's a subsidy for those who are, who are itemizers. Um, and not, since not everyone is an itemizer, we're encouraging some but not others. And of course, among the group of taxpayers that we're subsidizing, we're ta subsidizing them at different rates because they face different tax rates. Now, I'm working on, a, on an estimate of what the impact, and I'm doing that with my colleague here at AEI, Derek Choi. He and I are trying to, to put a number, a uh, price tag, on what that impact will be on charitable giving. Um, our preliminary finding is that the, from a static sense, meaning holding constant the size of the economy, charitable giving will probably drop by about $12 billion as a result of this tax bill. That sounds like a lot of money. It's not inconsequential. It's relative to about $400 billion in annual giving. Um, and I do think, however, that, um, that the growth effects of the overall package will be important to consider in this project as well. And to the extent that the economy is growing and people have more incomes, then the actual dynamic number will be, will be less. Um, let me um, touch on one more issue and then I'll, I'll stop talking, which is the potential impact of tax reform on unoccupied housing. Um, the National Association of Real speaking of death threats, the, um, <laughs> the National Association of Realtors called the House Tax Bill, quote, an outright assault on ho home ownership in America. Mm -hmm. um, and a study they commissioned warned that comprehensive tax reform, uh, House Republican style, um, would result in an average drop in home values of 10%. And so the, a um, valiant effort, an intense lobbying campaign by them um, uh, included these, these campaign slogans. Um, furthermore, uh, the number of people who are able to utilize the home mortgage introduction falls from about 36 million down to about 16.7 million. And so that sort of further feeds the story um, that housing is going to uh, take it on the chin. Um, I think that that's false. Um, and I would remind folks, um, particularly folks who live in this area, that the median home price in America is $213,000. Um, a little bit hard for us uh, to imagine in this neighborhood, in these neighborhoods. Um, but lots of taxpayers, uh, even under the old system, aren't using this policy um, in many neighborhoods and may many communities. Um, many are unaffected. Um, the changes, uh, in addition, we should remember, um, are the, the, the provision still exists. And so, of course, people who are no longer utilizing it are oftentimes, not always, oftentimes choosing not to use it because they're receiving a larger tax break uh, from the new system. Um, so there's more cash in hand. Um, I'll, let me just wrap up by saying um, there's some academic literature on this front as well in this month's uh, American Economic Review. Camila Summer and Paul Sullivan um, try to estimate the impact of outright repeal. They find the impact to be only 4%, which I think is also even an underestimate. So um, let me wrap up there and stop and, uh, and, and turn it back uh, to Alan. Thanks, Alex. And last but not least, we'll hear from Marty Sullivan of Tax Analysts. 
Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alex. Thank AEI. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. Um, I have some slides. Do you have a, okay, go on. Uh, it's great to be on this prestigious panel, but they didn't leave me anything to talk about, so uh, <laughs> I'll try to squeeze something in. Um, the astute people in the audience will notice an error on this slide, but we'll just leap yeah. right over that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best it's going to get, folks. <laughs> um, pros and cons of the bill. Uh, what I want to focus on, just to give it a little, is to focus on the business side. And uh, let, I just want to ask the question, are businesses more likely to uh, locate their factories in the United States before or after the bill? So let's go through the major pros and cons of what's in this bill. So as... Obviously, the major benefit is the 14% rate cut. And uh, when you factor in the uh, state and local deduction and a loss of Section 199, which was sort of like a rate cut, it's really only 12.5% cut. But 12.5% is a huge uh, change. Expensing, uh, only for five years and only for equipment uh, assets less than 20 years, but it is a major benefit. So we got those two things going on. That's going to help. Uh, uh, incentivize investment in the United States. On the minus side, you have interest limitations, uh, which, if you are financing through debt, are going to be a negative. But the magnitude of that seems to be relatively small, um, but uh, it is there. We have something uh, we in the tax world call FIDI, F-D-I-I. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what the how we should say it, but uh, we'll leave that. That's the biggest debate in economics right now. Um, but what it is, it is a 13.25% uh, uh, rate for in certain income generated in the United States uh, related to exports. So that's an additional incentive to invest in the United States. Then we have something else called guilty, which uh, was originally set up to prevent foreign firms from uh, getting unfair tax advantages vis-a-vis -vis U.S. firms. Uh, it didn't come out that way in the end. Basically, it, is, it does dis uh, reduce tax benefits for investing in the United States. So um, that's uh, going to, um, uh, let's see, it's going to, guilty is going to, that's going to help uh, investment in the United States, a hurt investment in the United States. And then we also have, uh, what's called the BEAT. And what the BEAT does is it increases taxes of U.S. firms operating abroad. So where before you might have been able with some deft uh, track tax planning to pay 0% abroad, this is like a minimum tax that hits you with, a with up to a 13.25% rate. And there are a lot of details that actually might be higher. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the bill that people don't uh, talk about because this is more than enough. But in general, they raise business taxes. Now, I built, because I'm an economist, they built the model. I put this all together. I made a whole bunch of assumptions. And uh, when I added them all up, on average, and there are no average firms in the United States, so with that caveat, uh, it is a net, this bill is a net positive for American business. Uh, it's a net positive for foreign firms to invest in the United States. And it's a net positive for American firms to stay in the United States. However, the playing field is still tilted a little bit in favor of foreign investment. So it's, I'm not trying to be uh, uh, cute here. I'm just trying to, is that the tilt of the playing field is more in favor of the United States, but it's still a little bit negative. Uh, this is a very preliminary assessment. Um, so I reserve the right to change my mind. Um, now, the, what I just talked about were the direct effects of the legislation. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on besides what's in the statute, and I always want to mention that. Rising deficits, uh, which, of course, Maya is focused on. And by the way, Maya has one of the greatest quotes, uh, if I can get it from memory, uh, if I, well, please I correct me. Uh, the the grown-ups in Congress, after the uh, spending bill where they did $300 billion in two years, uh, the grown-ups in Congress are having a feast, and they pass the bill on to the kids' table. I think that's, that really does summarize uh, what, uh, what the Congress did. But at any rate, the economic effects of deficits are not good. They're going to raise interest rates and they're going to cause crowding out. So we have to uh, consider that effect as well. We have to consider the reaction function, as economists call it, of what foreign governments are going to do. 
And if foreign governments cut their taxes in response to our tax cut, well, that's not, uh, therefore, that's tilting the playing field uh, back to the foreign side. So if we reduce our, you know, to take the extreme example, if we reduce ours by 12.5% and everybody else reduces theirs by 12.5%, well, then, you know, nothing gained. Uh, and almost every time I talk to somebody from another country, yesterday it was Australia, but you have India, China, possibly Germany, France, UK. They're all talking, they're all doing or, or very seriously talking about cutting their rates. So this is going to dilute the benefits of tax reform for us. Uh, state governments are talking about increasing their taxes as they go, hey, you just got a 12 and a 14% tax cut. You're a, you're a sitting duck for a tax increase. So that would diminish the benefits of this. And then finally, there's uncertainty, uncertainty, and uncertainty. Uh, there, and uncertainty is very bad for investment. We have built in, uh, we didn't deal with the extenders in this bill. In fact, we added new extenders to this bill, so that's built in uncertainty into the law. Um, we have, uh, because we have larger deficits, I'm an old enough to remember the 1981 tax cuts of Ronald Reagan, and immediately after that, the deficit exploded, and we had to have 82 tax increases and 84 tax increases. That is not out of the question uh, that this will happen again. So if I'm considering investing in the United States, Long term, is, is it really going? Is this is this tax cut really going to be permanent? Um, and then uh, the other thing, which is dominating the practitioner community now, which is only about uh, nine hundred thousand people in the United States, nobody really understands what's going on in this bill. Uh, practitioners who have been studying this since December twenty second, when it was signed into law, are still trying to figure out what to tell their clients. Their clients don't know what they should do for, uh, with respect to tax planning, what they should do with respect to their uh, long-term investment ideas. So this is a major problem. And that's a result of how fast the bill, uh, largely a result of how fast the uh, bill went through Congress. Uh, foreign governments are talking about treaty violations and WTO violations, which might negate some of this. And then uh, I, there is a chance that uh, Republicans may not stay in power for the next uh, seven years. And because this was such a partisan bill, it is politically unstable. So all of these factors uh, are, are, are working sort of subtly behind the scenes. I have one more minute, because now it's very strict. And uh, I'll just show you one last slide, which is a very simple slide. The blue line is projected deficits from the CBO. The latest available numbers are from August. So these are ancient, but that's all we got. That's the blue line. And as you can see, and as Maya stressed, we are going to be borrowing a lot of, even before this tax bill, we're going to be borrowing a lot of money. Then I, myself, uh, added on top of this the effect of the tax cuts, which, of course, increases the deficit. So you see we're going to be at about a trillion dollars you know, in 2020. Now, this was before... This is before the $300 billion over two-year spending bill, so that red line is going to go up even more. So we are in absolutely unprecedented territory, because even if you go back to 1946, we knew the deficit was going to go down there. If this line was extended out, it would be up over here. And uh, the one reason we can be certain about that, we economists are very bad at predicting things, but demographers are very good at predicting um, population, and our population is aging. Um, so what you need to look for coming soon, any day now, and I've been waiting every day, is the CBO is going to uh, bring out their new economic and budget outlook, and then we're going to have new, official, rock-solid, or as solid as these things get, nonpartisan uh, deficit numbers, and the story in Washington is going to be the deficit, and Maya is going to have tons of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Marty. Well, thanks to all of the panelists. Uh, all of you did stay within the uh, strict 10-minute limit, and uh, you covered an amazing amount of ground in discussing uh, this very wide-ranging law. So luckily, we do have some time uh, for audience questions. Um, if, pl please wait to be called upon, and also wait for the microphone to come to you, and then if you could introduce yourself and your organization. Bob Goulder with Tax. Uh, how bad does the debt need to get before the border adjustment is back on the table? <laughs> uh, well, what? Yeah. I, you know, 
th those are words we thought we would never hear again. Um, <laughs> water adjustment. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think that uh, most economists believe that the long-run solution to the country's fiscal imbalance will end up being a value-added tax. Now, the interesting thing about a value-added tax is, of course, that it is border-adjusted, and border-adjusting it is not controversial uh, for various reasons that we don't have time to go into. All these issues that came up in the debate in 2017 about border adjustment get sidestepped when there's a VAD. We don't have a WTO problem. People don't worry about exchange rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess you could argue in that sense uh, the border adjustment uh, would eventually show up, I think, in a value-added tax. Now, when I say that we're likely to end up with value-added tax, I don't mean this year. I don't mean <laughs> next year. I don't necessarily mean this decade. Uh, but I mean that as we head into the upcoming decades, uh, you yeah, know, that's the, uh, the, the path I, I think that we'll end up on. Certainly the path that almost every other country in the world has taken. Uh, I'd just add, um, and the, the, the question is such a good one, given the fact that the cost of the bill was the cost of the revenue, you know, the trillion and a half dollar net impact of the bill is exactly what would have, the hole that would have been filled with the reporter adjustment tax. And it also happens to be the cost of the corporate tax cut. So these, this $1.5 trillion number is somehow magic and, and, <laughs> and a bit, not necessarily in a good way. Um, and yeah. so at some point, we're going to need to find a solution. Uh, um, yeah, great question. I, I don't know what the tipping point for people waking up about the debt is going to be because it should have already happened. Um, I do think that I do think when CBO comes out with its numbers, and actually we're going to come out with a bunch of updated numbers this week on what the deficit estimates are going to be. So there's a little teaser. Um, the numbers won't be good. Um, but I think there's the chance that the trillion-dollar number gets a lot more attention in the media. The last time we had trillion-dollar deficits, it's when we had a huge, huge recession, 2008. And that was a wake-up call about fiscal issues, even though fiscal issues weren't the primary problem at the moment. The recession was. So this time... I think unless, unless we have become just kind of so used to it that we don't care, I think we're about to have a pretty big wake-up call. And I'm curious what 2020 is going to look like when this, this is an issue, fiscal issues and making the hard choices to fix the problem that doesn't come from the grassroots. It comes from the top down. And so I think the presidential election and whether the discussion looks at it will make a huge difference. So the question of what will make us start to care enough that we take some actions I don't know. I guess the best I'm doing right now is sort of standing ready for whenever there's an opening with a lot of ideas to move forward. But I do, like Alan was saying, I think the border adjustment tax will come back in a different form and or a carbon tax is likely to be on the table. And basically the, my conclusion is if we hadn't done this tax cut, we would probably be still thinking about base broadening and ways to get new revenue from tax reform. But now that we did, I think a new revenue stream maybe five years from now, is much more likely than it was before. And, and let me just say, uh, in 1992, uh, when the debt-to-GDP debt ratio was about 35%, uh, two candidates, one named Bill Clinton and another one, a crazy guy named Gross Perot, who ended up getting 90% on the vote, ran on reducing the deficit. And we don't have any of that. I mean, look at this, this presidential, last presidential campaign. 17 Republicans ran. None of them were talking about reducing the deficit, and I don't think uh, Mrs. Clinton was either. So um, uh, we really need Ross Perot. The, the next back. incarnation of Ross Perot. <laughs> you on that. <laughs> Hi, uh, Pat Spann. I um, just re re retired, Govey. Um, I wonder if you guys could look in the crystal ball, and because I, I've uh, I noticed um, I ran the numbers with the rates. If you had a taxable income of 165k, you saved 5,000 about 5,000 a year in taxes, but the the reduction of uh, the personal exemption and the miscellaneous deductions and the limit on the state tax pretty well eliminates that. Maybe may a wash for a lot of people. So I'm I'm wondering if you could look in your crystal ball. And what do you think the, the likelihood that when people finally realize that the personal exemption is gone and things like home equity interest is gone and the miscellaneous deductions, especially um, uh, asset management fees, are gone, how likely are they to stay in, in, in the law? Um, I can take this. So I think that the, the group of people that are sort of on that margin where 
the elimination of the personal exemption plus the higher standard deduction and some limitations on itemized deductions are right around where you speak, where you're talking like upper, upper mm -hmm. middle class taxpayers, where it's like, okay, maybe I'll get like a $40 tax cut or I'll get a slight tax increase. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether that's enough pressure to say, oh, okay, we got to scrap this. I mean, that's not a majority of people. Most yeah. people are down at a much lower levels of income where they're getting the benefit of um, the standard deduction significantly along with the larger child tax credit. There is another issue, though, lurking in your question, I think, which beyond the fact that some people may find themselves with tax increases, as a few, certainly a, a minority of taxpayers will, but there is also just policy provisions in this law that I think have not gotten a lot of attention. And you mentioned the elimination of the miscellaneous itemized deductions. So employee business expense deduction is in that category, and so that's been eliminated. That's a broad category, and I think there's some expenses being claimed there that do have a very large personal component to them. Nevertheless, some of those really are costs of earning income, and the decision to repeal that deduction, I think, really has a lot of implications. And I, as far as I can tell, that received almost no attention during mm -hmm. the deliberations over the bill and still has received very little attention, even though uh, the bill was signed into law two months ago. Uh, the moving expense deduction was also eliminated. That was intended you know, to provide tax relief for people who are moving to take a new job. Um, I think some of the same issues there. I think there's pro and con arguments you can make on these provisions, but there really are some things lurking in there. People don't fully realize they're in there yet. I, too, wonder how policy will evolve uh, once those provisions become more widely known. Thank you, distinguished panel. Andrew, I'm from Congressman Paulson's office. And my question is specifically for Ms. McGinnis, but anyone else who can answer, feel free to share your expertise. You've written before, very eloquently, Ms. McGinnis, in the Ripon Forum, that entitlement reform is one of your possible solutions to pay for this huge reform of taxes. Can you go a little bit into, in a perfect world, if there was the political leverage for that, what those entitlement reforms would look like? Do you have specific policy ideas or best practices that if this does become possible, which programs we should look at and what types of reforms we should be aware of most? Sure, happily. But let me just reframe that, that I, don't, I didn't write that entitlement reform should be put in place to pay for the tax cut, because I think that's what kills entitlement reform. We had to do entitlement reform before the tax cut, both because it's the part of our budget that's growing so fast and squeezing out all other parts of the budget and putting fiscal pressure on, and because if we don't make changes to Social Security and Medicare, there are going to be really potentially devastating cuts, particularly in Social Security, where there'll be abrupt cuts across the board if we wait until the trust funds aren't, aren't able to pay full benefits. So we need to fix entitlements, and I'll, I'll say how, but I think having done the tax cuts first in the form of cuts that weren't revenue neutral, either through base broadening or spending cuts that were attached at the time, we've made this much more difficult because the framing is now, what, you want to take money out of Social Security to pay for those tax cuts for corporations? And that is a terrible frame that does a real uh, disservice to getting it done. So we still need to do it as much as ever. Um, and I would argue we're going to need new revenue to deal with the fiscal challenges that we have unquestionably. I thought we needed to before that we could have gotten out of tax reform. I think after the tax cuts, we need it more than ever. But the key issues are we are living longer. If you take Social Security, when it was built, when it was created, the retirement age was 65, the life expectancy was 62. That was a program that was going to make sense and, and work actuarially until, of course, the first recipient, Ida May Fuller, lived to be 100, which should have been like a little teaser of what was going to happen. But I think you have to look at how you slow the growth of benefits in those programs for people who don't depend on the program more. So I definitely think slowing the growth at the top end makes sense. I think you have to calculate CPI using something called chain CPI, which is a more accurate measure. Um, and I certainly think we have to look at how to gradually increase the retirement age and index that to longevity. Um, I'd index as many things as possible because Congress doesn't like to make hard choices. So if you can build those indexes into the program, they happen automatically, that would be a lot easier. I think you're also going to need new revenue to put into those programs. But what I urge is before we think about putting more money into a program like Social Security or Medicare, let's look at all the needs in the budget. When I think about looking forward what we need, this economy is changing so dramatically in terms of 
global, the effects from globalization, technology, uh, the future of work. And I would much rather think about new resources after we deal with the fiscal situation uh, that we decide we want to spend going into things like lifelong education and worker retraining, keeping us competitive as a workforce, figuring out what the future of work looks like in a changing economy. So rather than increasing or paying for all of my retirement benefits, assuming I won't need all of them, I would rather have those resources go somewhere else. Um, and then finally, there's still so much to be done in healthcare. The controlling cost portion of healthcare hasn't gotten enough of the attention. Uh, we don't know how to fix that. I can tick off all the things in Social Security pretty easily. It's just a bunch of levers you move. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, we have to keep trying to control costs in as many ways as possible. I think changing incentives is a critical piece of that uh, and continue to expand those throughout the system. But there are others on the panel who also know mm -hmm. a lot about the topics. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>